The World War II Battle of Lanzarote Ridge was fought on December 16, 1944, the first day of the Battle of the Bulge, near the town of Lanzarote, Belgium. It was fought between 18 men belonging to an American reconnaissance platoon, four U.S. forward artillery observers, and a battalion of about 500 German paratroopers. During a day-long confrontation, the American reconnaissance men inflicted dozens of casualties on the Germans and bottled up the advance along a key route for the 1st SS Panzer Division, which had been selected to spearhead the advance of the entire German 6th Panzer Army. The Germans finally flanked the American forces at dusk, capturing them. Only one American, a Ford artillery observer, was killed, while 14 were wounded, German casualties totaled 92. The Germans paused, believing the woods were filled with more Americans and tanks. Only when SS Standart in far one quarter Ray Joachim Pieper and his panzer tanks arrived at midnight, 12 hours behind schedule, did the Germans learn the woods were empty. Due to lost communications with battalion and then regimental headquarters, and the unit's subsequent capture, its disposition and successor delaying the advance of the 6th Panzer Army that day was unknown to the U.S. commanders. Lieutenant Lalbu considered the wounding of most of his men and the capture of his entire unit a failure. When the war ended five months later, the platoon's men, who were split between two prisoner of war camps, just wanted to get home. It was only after the war that Bug learned that, because his platoon prevented the lead German infantry elements from advancing, the schedule for the armored unit's advance was also pushed back by about 20 hours. On October 26, 1981, after considerable lobbying, a congressional hearing, and letter writing by Buch, every member of the unit were finally recognized for their valor that day, making the platoon the most decorated American unit of World War II. Background Prior to the Battle of the Bulge, the U.S. Army was engaged in a campaign to attack the Ruhr River dams before invading the rest of Germany. The 99th Infantry Division was supporting the 2nd Infantry Division in their attack on the German West Wall at Walliriad. During two days of hard fighting, the U.S. Army had finally managed to slip through the heavily fortified lines and penetrate the German defenses. The Americans were expecting a counterattack in the area, but their intelligence completely failed to detect the Germans' movement of hundreds of armored vehicles and tens of thousands of infantry into the region. Much of the region was relatively quiet, lending the area the title of Ghost Front. During early December 1944, the Americans' defensive line in the Ardennes had a gap south of Losheimer Graben. General Leonard Tedro, in command of V Corps, recognized this area as a possible avenue of attack by the Germans. This area, which lay between V Corps and Troy H. Middleton's VIII Corps, was undefended. Just patrolled by Jeep. The patrols in the northern part of the area were conducted by the 99th Infantry Division's 394th Intelligence and Reconnaissance Platoon, whereas those in the south were conducted by the 18th Cavalry Squadron, 14th Cavalry Group, which was attached to the 106th Infantry Division. In the border area between Germany and Belgium, there was only one road network that could support a military advance, it was through the area known as the Loschen Gap, a five miles long, narrow valley at the western foot of the Schnee Eifel. This was the key route through which the German 6th and 5th Panzer Armies planned to advance. On December 11, General Walter M. Robertson, commander of the Battle Hard and 2nd Infantry Division, was ordered to attack and seize the Ruhr River dams. In case he had to pull back, he chose Elsenborn Ridge as his defensive line. General Walter E. Lauer, commanding the 99th Infantry Division, was charged with building up the defences around Elsenborn Ridge. Lauer knew his front was very long and very thinly manned. He gave instructions to his division's soldiers to dig in and build cover for their foxholes. Prelude, inexperienced American units. The troops of the 99th Infantry Division, who lacked battle experience, were deployed to the Ardennes in November 1944 with the 394th Regiment relieving 9th Infantry Division's 60th Regiment, which unit Major Chris, the 394th S commanding officer, had fought in during the North African campaign before he was wounded and sent home to recuperate. Among the units were two reconnaissance squads consisting of well-trained soldiers, 
who had been selected because they were expert marksmen and in peak physical condition. Some of the men were college educated and were former members of the U.S. Army's abruptly terminated ASTP program. Led by 20 year old Lieutenant Lal Book, the second youngest man in the unit, for the next few weeks his reconnaissance platoon established and maintained regimental listening and observation posts, conducted patrols behind enemy lines, and gathered information. They lived in a brick building in Ha One Court in Ninjin, taking advantage of a basement full of potatoes and a homemade stove to supplement the military sea rations. The platoon consisted of two nine-man reconnaissance squads and a seven-man headquarters section, which was attached to the 394th Regimental S2 section. As the platoon was not intended, nor trained, for combat, they were told to avoid direct engagement with the Germans. Nonetheless, they took part in several missions behind enemy lines, even as far as Loshim two miles behind the front line, to capture enemy soldiers for intelligence. Book and several of his men were among the first group in their regiment to be recognized with the combat infantry badge. Most often their patrols consisted of creeping through snow-clogged defiles obscured by fog in an attempt to fix enemy positions. On December 10, the reconnaissance platoon was ordered by Major Chris to a new position, about six miles southeast of Ha One Court in Ningen, near Lanzareth, Belgium, a village of about 15 homes. The village lay at a critical road junction in the northern part of the Loshim Gap. The 18-man unit was charged by Chris with plugging a five miles gap in the front line between the 106th Division to the south and the 99th Division to the north. The only reserve was the 394th Infantry Regiment's 3rd Battalion, which was at Buckholt Station. Behind them lay roads that would give the enemy rapid access to the army's rear and allow them to easily flank the thinly placed 99th Division. American defensive preparations, the INR platoon took over positions on a ridge top immediately northeast of Lanzareth that were formerly occupied by part of the 2nd Infantry Division. They were ordered to improve their foxhole positions and maintain contact with Task Force X, made up of four towed 3-inch guns from the 2nd platoon. Company A, 820th Tank Destroyer Battalion, which was attached to the 14th Cavalry Group, 106th Infantry Division of 8 Corps. They were reinforced by the 22 men of the 820th S 2nd Recon Platoon, commanded by Lieutenant John Arclear, who were mounted on an armored half track and two jeeps. Members of the 2nd Platoon took up positions within two homes inside the village of Lanzareth, about 200 yards to the southeast. Together, the two units comprised the foremost units in their sector of the American forces facing the Siegfried Line. The Americans were attacking through the Siegfried Line at Wallery at about five miles to the north, and a localized counter-attack was expected. Lieutenant Boog followed procedure and ordered his men to build fortifications with interlocking fields of fire. Taking advantage of the foxholes left by the previous unit, they dug them deeper so that two or three men could stand in them and fire from the concealed edges. They covered each hole with 8 inches to 12 inches pine logs. Their hilltop location was just inside the edge of a forest and overlooked a pasture bisected by a 4 feet high barbed wire fence parallel to their location. Their position covered about 300 yards along a shallow ridge line, about 30 feet above the road and 200 yards northwest of the village. Their foxholes were situated in a shallow curve along the ridge line in a northeast direction, almost to a fork in the road at their left flank. Snow fell, covering their dug-in fortifications inside the woods, leaving them virtually invisible from the road below. They took advantage of a small log hut behind their position, which they used as a warming hut. Book augmented the unit's weaponry with four extra carbines, two Browning automatic rifles, and one light .30 caliber machine gun. Avoiding official channels, he traded his unit's collection of German memorabilia with an ordnance supply officer for an armored jeep with a mounted .50 caliber machine gun. His men dug an emplacement for the armored jeep and its .50 caliber gun, placing it in enfilade down the road along the Germans' possible axis of advance. Once an hour, in an attempt to fill the gap in their sector, they ran a jeep patrol up and down the line to stay in contact with units on their right and left flank and to detect any enemy movement. They hoped they would be relieved soon, 
we weren't trained to occupy a defensive position in the front lines. We were trained to patrol and get information about the enemy, Book said in an interview 60 years later. On the night of December 16, they heard the clanking of armor and the sound of vehicles in the distance. Book ordered his men to remain awake. The temperature ranged from 20 AA degree Fahrenheit to the low 30 AA degree Fahrenheit during the day. German positions, many of the German units were recent conscripts with very little experience. Sergeant Vins Kilbach's platoon was typical. Most of his soldiers had little combat experience and even less training. The German units had been formed by conscripting teenage boys and men over 50, men previously rejected as physically unfit for service, wounded soldiers newly released from hospitals, and men transferred from the jobless personnel of the shrinking Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe. The German 3rd Volksschirmjäger Division, which had previously acquired a superb combat reputation, had been virtually destroyed during the Normandy invasion in the Fairless Pocket. It had been resurrected by using replacements from the 22nd, 51st, and 53rd Luftwaffe field regiments. The German units were usually organized around small cadres of seasoned veterans. Although they carried the new Schmeisser machine pistol and were equipped with rifle grenades, few had ever fired them in combat. The German recruits were told the American soldiers they faced would not have the nerve to stand and fight. Their officers said the Americans were a gum-chewing, undisciplined half-breed with no stomach for real war. To preserve the available armor, the infantry of the 9th Volkschirmjäger Regiment, 3rd Volkschirmjäger Division, had been ordered to lead the attack through Lanzarith and clear the village before advancing towards Bullingen. The German commanders estimated they would face a full division of U.S. troops. The Germans' initial position was east of the German-Belgium border and the Siegfried Line near Loschim. SS Obersttruppen Far 1 Quarter Rare Sept Dietrich's plan was for the 6th Panzer to advance northwest through Loschim Graben and Buchholz Station and then drive 72 miles through Honsfield, Bar 1 Quarter Lingen, and a group of villages named Trois Ponts, to connect to Belgian Route Nationale N23 and cross the River Meuse. It was then another 53 miles to Antwerp. Unfortunately for the Germans, during their retreat earlier that autumn they had destroyed the Loschim Loschimer Graben Road bridge over the railway, which prevented their use of this route. While German infantry were able to use the Lanzarith Loschimer Graben Road to advance on Loschimer Graben, the railroad overpass could not bear the weight of the German armor. On the first day of the offensive, the German engineers were slow to repair the Loschim Loschimer Graben Road, thus forcing Pieper's vehicles to take the road through Buchholz Station. Once the infantry captured Lanzarith, Sepp Dietrike Euro unregistered trademark S 6th Panzer Army led by Kampgrupp SS Standart in Far 1 Quarter Rear Joachim Pieper's 1st SS Panzer Division would proceed without delay. The infantry would then secure the right flank of the attack route near Loschimer Graben. Despite the losses that had brought the Allies to the border of their homeland, German morale was surprisingly strong. The men knew the Allies were demanding an unconditional surrender. They were now fighting for the fatherland, defending the soil of their beloved country, not just fighting for Hitler. Dietrich knew the plan had flaws. The Germans had captured the same terrain during the summer of 1940 in three days. Now they were being asked to do it in winter in five days. The plan counted on bad weather to keep the Allied planes grounded. Dietrich only had one quarter the fuel they needed. Their plan counted on capturing Allied fuel depots and keeping to an ambitious timetable. Dietrich's assigned route included narrow roads a euro in many places single tracks a euro, which would force units of the camp group to tail each other, creating a column of infantry and armor up to 25 kilometers long. The roads would prevent the attackers from concentrating their forces in the blitzkrieg fashion which had served them so well in the past. The main roads designated for their use had many hairpin turns and traversed steep hillsides that would delay his already slow-moving towed artillery and bridging trains. Dietrich knew that a determined fight at one of these critical choke points by even a token U.S. force could seriously impede his schedule. When Hitler's operations officer General Oberst Alfred Jodl gave him his orders, Dietrich yelled, I'm a general, not a bloody undertaker. Battle, German Barrage 
On December 16, 1944, at 5.30, the Germans launched a 90-minute artillery barrage using 1,600 artillery pieces across an 80-mile front, although the American platoon was only aware of what was happening in their sector. Their first impression was that this was the anticipated counterattack resulting from the Allies' recent attack in the wall Eriad sector to the north where the 2nd Division had knocked a sizable dent into the Siegfried line. Buch later said, many shells exploded in the trees, sending shards of steel and wood into the ground, but the men were protected by their reinforced foxholes. The German guns cut deep holes the size of trucks in the pasture. German advance German infantry began to advance near Loshim before the artillery barrage lifted, preparing to cross the front line as soon as it ended. They marched under the glow of massive searchlights, bouncing light off the clouds. The armor was located farther back, near Blankenheim, Germany. At 8 o'clock, as the sun rose, the American platoon heard explosions and guns around Buchholz Station and Glosheimer Grab and to the east and north where the 3rd and 1st Battalions of the 394th Infantry Division was located. The 55 soldiers of U.S. 2nd Platoon, Company A, 820th Tank Destroyer Battalion, 14th Cavalry Group was initially ordered south to help protect Manderfeld, but shortly afterwards were redirected to join the active battle near Buchholz Station. They withdrew from the village and left without contacting the I and R platoon. This left the platoon as the only unit in the sector and without armor support. Buck sent James, Zlape and Kreger to set up an observation post in a house on the eastern side of the village that had been abandoned by Task Force X accompanying them. He spotted in the dawn light a long column of what appeared to be about 500 German troops headed toward them from the east. Their distinctive helmet style told Buck they were paratroopers among the best soldiers Germany could field. None of his training or experience prepared him for this situation, outnumbered as he was by perhaps twenty to one. Buch and James scrambled back to the ridgetop and the rest of their unit. The platoon's telephone landline to 1st Battalion headquarters in Loshimagraben was knocked out, but their SCR 300 radio still worked. Buch reached regimental headquarters at Ha One Court and Ningen in the radio and requested permission to withdraw and engage in a delaying action. He was told to remain in position and reinforcements from the 3rd Battalion will come to support you. In town, Kreger watched as a forward element of the German infantry advanced, with weapons slung, into Lanzareth. They obviously did not expect to encounter any Americans. Kreger radioed Buch and told him of the Germans advancing through Lanzareth on the road between Kreger and Buch's position. Buch sent Robinson, McShehe and Silverler to assist Kreger, who crept down to the Buchholz station road and thence up a ditch towards Lanzareth. Before the three men reached Kreger, he left the village using a more direct route. As he returned to the American lines, he engaged and killed or wounded most of a German platoon. On the eastern side of the road, Robinson, McShehe and Silverler attempted to rejoin their platoon, but found the way blocked by German soldiers who threatened to flank them. They decided to head for Loshimagraben and seek reinforcements. They crossed a 20 feet deep railroad cut and once on the far side encountered soldiers from Fusilier Regiment 27 of the 12th Volksknadia Division. Trying to outflank the 1st Battalion, 394th Infantry Regiment in Loshimagraben, they spotted the three men. After a brief firefight, Robinson and McJehe were wounded and all three were captured. Germans entered the home that Kreger and Slape were using as an observation post. Slape climbed into the attic, while Kreger only had time to hide behind a door. He pulled the pin on a grenade as the doorknob jammed into his ribs. Bullets from the I and R platoon struck the building, and the Germans suddenly left. Kreger and Slape exited by the back door and ducked into a nearby cowshed. They crossed a field and then found themselves in a minefield. Picking their way forward, they circled through the woods until they encountered a handful of Germans. Opening fire, they killed them. Kreger and Slape spotted Buch and Mala Savich across the road and sprinted towards them, drawing German fire. They made it back to their ridge top position and Buch called regimental headquarters. He requested artillery support, but when he reported the German column advancing on his position, the voice on the other end of the radio told him he must be seeing things. 
Boob told them he had 20-20 vision and demanded artillery fire on the road in front of his unit. U.S. artillery unavailable, but the platoon's position at the southern end of the 99th Division sector was not only outside their own regimental boundary, it was outside their division's boundary and B Corps boundary. The division prioritized artillery fire for targets within its boundary. Boog waited in vain for the sound of incoming artillery. He called regimental headquarters again, asking for directions. He was told to hold at all costs, which essentially meant until dead or captured. Boog knew that if his platoon gave way, the 99th Division's right flank, already thin and undermanned, could be in grave danger. Radio operator James Fort attempted to contact headquarters on the SC-284 radio mounted on a jeep by the command post and found that German martial music jammed the channel. He then used a side channel and Morse code, hoping the Germans weren't listening, to send a status report to regimental headquarters. German attack, as the German forces moved through Lanzarote and in front of their positions, Buch and his men allowed lead members of the unit to pass, hoping to surprise the Germans. They were preparing to fire on three men who they believed were the regiment's officers when a girl from the village emerged from one of the homes. Talking to the officers, she pointed in their general direction. An officer yelled a command, and the paratroopers jumped for ditches on either side of the road. The Americans thought she had given their position away and fired on the Germans, wounding several. Four members of a forward observation team from Battery C. 371st Field Artillery had been in the village when the tank destroyer unit withdrew. Lieutenant Warren Springer and the other three men, Sergeant Peter Gacky, T-4 Willard Wibben, and T-5 Billy Queen joined Book's unit on the ridge where they could continue to observe the enemy movement. Book distributed them among the foxholes to help reload magazines and reinforce their position. The German infantry deployed and about two platoons of the 2nd Company. 1st Battalion, then attacked the Americans head-on, bunched together in the open and charging straight up the hill, directly at the platoon's hidden and fortified positions. The Americans were surprised at the inexperienced tactics. For the Americans, it was like shooting clay ducks in California at an amusement park. Several attackers were killed trying to climb over the four feet high barbed wire fence that bisected the field often shot at close range with a single shot to the heart or head. Lieutenant Springer used his jeep-mounted SCR-610 radio to call in coordinates for artillery fire. A few shells landed near the road outside Lanzareth, but they did not hinder the German attack. His jeep was then struck by machine gun fire or mortar shrapnel and his radio was destroyed. Zlape and Milosevic fired continually, as fast as they could reload. Zlape thought the Germans were mad to attack in such a suicidal manner, straight across the open field. He later recalled that it was one of the most beautiful fields of fire he had ever seen. After only about 30 seconds, the firing stopped. Nearly all of the attacking Germans had been killed or wounded. McConnell, shot in the shoulder, was the only American casualty. During a second attack made around 11.00 a.m., Milosevic fired the .50 caliber jeep-mounted machine gun until enemy fire drove him back into his foxhole. In both the first and second attack that morning no German soldier got past the fence in the middle of the field. Bodies were piled around it. German medics waved a white flag late in the morning and indicated they wanted to remove the wounded, which the American defenders allowed. The Americans again suffered only one wounded on the second attack when Private Callal was struck in the face by a rifle grenade that failed to explode. The Germans mounted a third attack late in the afternoon, around 3.00. Several times German soldiers attempted to penetrate the American lines. The Americans left their foxholes and in close combat fired on the attackers to push them back down the hill. At one point PFC Milsovich spotted a medic working on and talking to a soldier he felt certain was already dead. As mortar fire on his position got more accurate, Milsovich noticed a pistol on the supposed medic's belt, and decided he must be calling in fire on their position. He shot and killed him. Boog contacted regimental headquarters once more, seeking reinforcements. At 3.50, Fort sent the unit's last update to regimental headquarters in Ha-1 Court in Ninjin. 
he reported they were still receiving some artillery fire but were holding their position against an estimated enemy strength of about 75, who were attempting to advance from Lanzareth towards the railroad to the northwest. As dusk approached and their ammunition ran dangerously low, Book feared they could be flanked at any time. He planned to pull his men back just before dusk, when they would have enough light to escape through the woods. Book ordered his men to remove the distributor caps from their jeeps and to prepare to evacuate to the rear. He dispatched Corporal Sam Jenkins and PFC Preston through the woods to locate Major Chris at regimental headquarters and seek instructions or reinforcements. Book tried to contact regimental headquarters on the SCR 300 radio for instructions. A sniper shot the radio as Book held it to his ear. The sniper also hit the SCR 284 radio mounted in the jeep behind Book, eliminating any possibility of calling for reinforcements or instructions. The German troops were reluctant to attack head on once again, and Sergeant Vince Kulbach pleaded with the officers of the 9th Falls Chamjaja Regiment to allow his men to flank the Americans in the dusk. Fifty men from Fusilia Regiment 27 of the 12th Folks Canadia Division were dispatched to attack the American southern flank through the woods. Just as Buch was about to blow his whistle to indicate withdrawal, German soldiers penetrated their lines and began overrunning their foxholes. Several attackers were killed by grenades rigged to wires and triggered by Americans in their foxholes. Each of the positions spread out over the ridge top were overrun in turn. Surprisingly, the Germans did not simply kill the defenders in their foxholes. Buch was pulled from his foxhole by an officer with a machine gun, and he thought he would be shot when the German put his weapon in his back and pulled the trigger. It was empty. Both Buch and the German officer were then struck by bullets. The German fell seriously wounded, while Buch was struck in the calf. Sergeant Kilback asked Buch who was in command, and Buch replied that he was. Kilback asked him why the Americans were still shooting, and Book said it was not his men doing it. Book surrendered and helped carry his wounded men down to the village. Conclusion During their dawn to dusk fight, a 15 remaining men of the IR platoon plus the four men of the 371st Artillery Forward Observation Team repeatedly engaged elements of the 1st Battalion, 9th Falls Chamjaja Regiment, 3rd Falls Chamjaja Division of about 500 men. The Germans reported 16 killed, 63 wounded, and 13 missing in action. Other reports say the Americans inflicted between 60 and 500 casualties on the Germans. Only one American, Ford Artillery Observer Billy Queen, was killed. In Book's platoon, 14 out of 18 men were wounded. The small American force had seriously disrupted the schedule of the entire 6th Panzer Army's drive for Antwerp along the entire northern edge of the offensive. After virtually no sleep during the preceding night and a full day of almost non-stop combat, with only a few rounds of ammunition remaining, flanked by a superior enemy force, the platoon and artillery observers were captured. Aftermath the German military took over several homes in Lanzareth and turned them into aid stations for the wounded of both sides. The rest of the homes were commandeered as temporary quarters. German armor advance. Camp Gruppieper, the lead element of the 6th Panzer Army Spearhead, 1st SS Panzer Division, consisted of 4,800 men and 600 vehicles. On December 16, it started as much as 36 kilometers to the east in Tondorf. Germany, and was unable to advance at its scheduled rate because of road congestion. The road from Ia to Loshim was one solid traffic jam, in part due to two blown railroad overpasses blocking access to Loshim Graben, but also due to American resistance. Pieper's lead units did not reach Loshim until 7.30 p.m., when he was ordered to swing west and join up with the 3rd Falls Chamjaja Division, which had finally cleared the route through Lanzareth. Pieper was furious about the delay. En route to Lanzareth, Pieper's unit lost five tanks and five other armored vehicles to American mines and anti-tank weapons. Camp Grupp Pieper finally reached Lanzareth near midnight. Lieutenant Book, held in Kafar copyrights Kjolten, turned 21 years old at midnight on December 17. At midnight, he watched as a senior German officer attempted to obtain accurate information about the U.S. Army's strength in the area. 
Pieper was told by Obersturm Banfall one quarter rare eye. G. von Hoffmann, a former Luftwaffe general staff officer from Berlin and commanding officer of the 9th Volkschirmjager Regiment, 3rd Volkschirmjager Division, that his men had run into stiff resistance. He reported that the woods and road ahead were packed with American troops and tanks. He had bedded his troops down for the night and planned to probe the forest for Americans at first light. Their expectations of further resistance was all based on the stiff defense offered by Boog's force of just 18 men. Pieper asked the battalion commander and a hopeman in the same unit about the American resistance. Both said they had not personally seen the Americans, but that the woods were heavily fortified. Pieper learned that no patrols had been conducted into the woods and no one had personally reconnoitred the area. Disgusted, Pieper demanded that von Hoffmann give him a battalion of paratroops to accompany his tanks. At 4.30 on December 17, more than 16 hours behind schedule, the 1st SS Panzer Division rolled out of Lanzarote and headed east for Buchholz Station. The entire timetable of their advance on the River Meuse and Antwerp had been seriously slowed, allowing the Americans precious hours to move in reinforcements. Pieper's lead units entered Buchholz Station without resistance at 5 o'clock a.m. They found only two rifle companies from the 3rd Battalion, 394th Infantry Regiment had been left to defend it. These were quickly captured, except for a headquarters company radio operator. Hidden in a cellar, he called in reports to division headquarters until he was finally captured. Driving east. The Germans entered Homsfield at 6 o'clock a.m. where his column merged in the dark with an American column. In Homsfield, they encountered one of the 99th Division's rest centers, which was clogged with still sleeping, confused American troops. They killed many, destroyed a number of American armored units and vehicles, and took several dozen prisoners, who were later executed by elements of his force. Based on the noise to the northeast, Pieper decided that the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend was encountering more resistance than expected. Unable to contact his division headquarters, and with his vehicles low on fuel, Pieper decided to switch his planned route to the south through Bar One Quarter Lingen, where he believed an American fuel depot existed. His units entered the town at 8 o'clock a.m. and easily captured 50,000 U.S. gallons of fuel for his vehicles. He was apparently unaware he had nearly taken the town and unknowingly bypassed an opportunity to flank and trap the entire 2nd and 99th Divisions. Pieper turned south to detour around Ha One Court and Ningen, interested only in hurrying west as quickly as he could. The unit gained notoriety when on this route they encountered a lightly armored American convoy and apparently murdered 84 U.S. prisoners of war in what became known as the Malmedy Massacre. The German advance never recovered from its initial delay, and Kampgrupp people only got as far as Stumont, where the remaining vehicles ran out of fuel and came under heavy attack from American artillery and tanks. Having advanced less than halfway to the River Meuse, they were forced to abandon more than a hundred vehicles in the town, including six Tiger II tanks. The soldiers were left to find their own way back to the east on foot. Having started the offensive with about 5,800 men, 60 tanks, 3 flak tanks, 75 half tracks, 14 20 mm flak wagons, 27 75 mm assault guns, plus 105 and 150 mm SP howitzers, Hitler's prized camp group was reduced to 800 SS troopers creeping through the brush at night, trying to get back to their own line. The task of defeating the 99th Division was the objective of 12th SS Panzer Division reinforced by additional Panzer Gnadier and Volksgenadier Divisions. On December 17, German engineers repaired one of the road bridges over the railroad along the Loschim Loschimer Graben Road and the 12th Division's armor began advancing towards the key road junction at Loschimer Graben in the twin villages of Rocherith and Krinkelt. However, in more than ten days of intense battle, they were unable to dislodge the Americans from Elsenborn Ridge, where elements of the V Corps of the 1st U.S. Army prevented the German forces from reaching the road network to their west. Due to the determined resistance of the 99th Division, which was composed of relatively inexperienced troops, along with the 2nd and 23rd Divisions, the northern shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge was a sticking point for the entire offensive operation. Had the Americans given way, 
the German advance would have overrun the vast supply depots around Liege and Spa and possibly have changed the outcome of the Battle of Bulge. Prisoners of war, the I and R platoon members who were able to walk were sent to Germany. James and Callil, who were seriously wounded, were loaded onto trucks and eventually transported to hospitals in Frankfurt and Hanover. McConnell, also wounded, ended up like James in Stalag 11b near Bad Falling Bostel, the most primitive POW camp in Germany where about 6,000 Soviet prisoners had died of typhus during 1941. After two days of walking through the cold, Buch and the remainder of his platoon were loaded into a box car in the village of Junkerith. They spent 11 days traveling deep into Germany, as the POW camps were overflowing with prisoners. Their unmarked trains were prime targets for Allied aircraft, who attacked Buch's train on December 21, killing and wounding several POWs. The prisoners were allowed off only once, and were given only some bread and water during the entire trip. Buch and his men were finally imprisoned in Stalag 13D in Nuremberg and later in Stalag 13C in Hamelberg, where the non-commissioned and enlisted men were split, with the officers sent to Oflug 13B. Corporal Sam Jenkins and PFC Preston were captured before they reached Allied lines, and they later joined Buch and the rest of the platoon in the prison. The men barely survived, most suffering from the advanced effects of malnutrition. When Task Force Born from Patton's 4th Armored Division attempted to liberate the camp, Buch pretended to be a field grade officer and accompanied the task force as it attempted to return to the front lines. However, Almost the entire task force was captured or killed, and Buch was returned to prison for the remainder of the war. When he was freed, he was too weak to file a combat report, and he did not think his men had accomplished that much. We were in those foxholes and... What we did was to defend ourselves and try to live through it. Unit recognition, all who were wounded and captured recovered to return home after the war. In 1965. The U.S. Army published a multi-volume history of World War II, including one on the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge. Author Hugh M. Cole only briefly mentioned Book's platoon, which upset former platoon member William James. James contacted Book and encouraged him to get his men proper recognition. Book contacted his former division commander, Major General Walter E. Lauer, who nominated Book for a Silver Star. In June 1966, a Silver Star arrived in Buch's mailbox, but no other platoon member was recognized. Buch was shortly afterward interviewed by John S. D. Eisenhower for his book The Bitter Woods, which described the actions of the units in detail. Columnist Jack Anderson unsuccessfully campaigned for William James to be awarded the Medal of Honor. Congressional hearings on the men's action resulted in a recommendation to the Secretary of Defense that Bill James be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. The U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force concurred, but the Marine Corporation responded that James failed to show sufficient intrepidity. The hearings also resulted in Public Law 96-145, which waived the time limitation exclusively for members of the platoon. It was signed by President Jimmy Carter on December 14, 1979. On October 26, 1981, after considerable lobbying and letter-writing by Book, the men of the unit were finally decorated. Fourteen of the eighteen were present at the ceremony hosted by Secretary of the Army John O. Marsh. Every man was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Four received the Distinguished Service Cross, five the Silver Star, and nine got the Bronze Star with V device for their ten-hour struggle against a 500-man strong German battalion. Platoon members and the citations they received were 1st Lieutenant Lal J. Book Jr. Tech. Sergeant William L. Zlape, PFC William James Zarkanikas, PFC Risto Milo Milsovich Private Robert D. Adams, Private Robert D. Barsh, Sergeant William D. Dustman, Private Clifford R. Fancher, T-3 James Fort Corporal Samuel L. Jenkins, Private Joseph A. McConnell, Corporal Robert H. Mock Preston, Sergeant George H. Papi Redmond, Private John B. Kredger, Private Louis J. Callil, Corporal Aubrey P. Schnes McGeehu PFC Jordan H. Pop Robinson, Private James R. Sil Silvela, 
Lieutenant Warren Springer and his three-man artillery observation unit a Euro Sergeant Peter Gackey, T-4 Willard Wibben, and T-5 Billy Queen, also joined the men in battle. Queen was killed in action before the remainder were captured. All four were awarded the DSC for their valor at Lanzareth. In 2004, the book The Longest Winter was published, documenting the defensive actions of the platoon. Boo cooperated with the author, Alex Kershaw, but imposed one condition, I told him that other authors never wrote about the other men in the platoon, just me. I said I wouldn't talk to him unless he promised that he'd also write about the other men. On May 12, 2005, veterans of the 99th Infantry Division and local citizens of Lanzareth, Belgium, dedicated a monument composed of a small brass plaque alongside a bench and a United States flag to commemorate the fight on the grassy hill overlooking the village. Uncommon Valor was a common valor, in honor and memory of all soldiers who fought here, December 16, A. 1944, I and our platoon, 394th Regiment, 99th Infantry Division. References Further reading